We are in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William. Good morning, Rob. I was struck by the fact that I enjoy seeing the candidates coming, aboard, coming on the show before the race, before the election, but a lot of them, regardless of whether they win or lose, come on after the election, which I think is very good. Mr. Gilstrap, good to see you again. New York Times best-selling author, yes, John indeed. Gilstrap. Yeah. And uh, via telephone, Dr. Stephen A. Goldman. He is uh, joining us ahead of a couple of big... Uh, talks he's about to give but uh in the aftermath of one he had the honor of doing memorial day uh weekend over at uh, gettysburg steve good morning to you sir good morning and good morning to the other gentlemen great to have you with us you've done so much work on uh civil war studies of soldiers you do uh, work as of course as a psychiatrist and you've dealt with veterans for a long time as well it must have been an absolute thrill to talk at gettysburg yeah it was terrific um and certainly doing it on memorial day um, was a thrill, and it. Uh, I, what I what I did emphasize when I was there was not just the relationship between, obviously, the Grand Army, uh, the Republic, and uh, Memorial Day, but the real meaning of Memorial Day, and it was not just about service itself, but why men and women throughout our history have served. And I think sometimes that link is not made. Dr. Goldman is an adjunct professor at Shepherd University and uh, has been on the program a couple of times before. Let's let's talk about that connection and that link. Uh, did you work that into your talk at Gettysburg? Oh, yeah. What I did was um, I specifically spoke about, I gave, I gave a talk I've given um, previously at Shepherd about one particular veteran uh, who I focused on in the book. Um, Joseph Wiley Gelray, um, who had been um, maimed at Gettysburg and who later became the lead investigator of the Ku Klux Klan for the Freedmen's Bureau. And he's a remarkable man. Uh, as a matter of fact, one kid and I, uh, my wife and I, tracked down his grave at Arlington, which was always a thrill when you do that. And I made, I used his life as an example of, you know, the themes that, that the three of us have talked about before, that it's not just the reasons why wars are fought, but, but what happens when you return from those wars and the great responsibility that American veterans have, have accepted, basically since the Civil War, of continuing the work as civilians that they accepted during the time they were in the military. So with Gelray who stayed in the military, even though he had lost an arm, um, his commitment to the Freedmen's Bureau was just redoubled by what he had fought for literally during the Civil War. And it's, it's a remarkable story. And again, this is, you know, as you know, Rob, that's, that's, what I, that's the story I told in One More War to Fight. Um, the plans are my actual Civil War book will be out next year, so it's really the prequel to One More War to Fight which establishes why the um, white and African-American men fought the Civil War, which, as you know, has not always been emphasized, that um, they were predominantly volunteers, and that in particular African-American uh, men, both free men of color and men who were previously enslaved, put up with such hardships just to serve, just to get the opportunity to fight, and again, these, these are stories that are so important, and they couldn't be more relevant now. It was on this date in 1863 that the Battle of Aldi was fought in the Gettysburg Campaign. And people think of the Gettysburg Campaign as being a bit more July, but there is a lot going on that led up to that. And you'll be speaking again in Gettysburg this upcoming Friday night, correct? Yeah. Um, it's a different venue that I've not spoken at before. Um, and I'm pretty excited about it. It's at the Seminary Ridge Museum, so it's literally on the battlefield. And what I'm going to be speaking about there is the unfinished work. And um, my focus is going to be on reunions of Union veterans at Gettysburg, in particular in relation to reconciliation, the memory of the war, and resisting the encroachment of the lost cause mentality. So um, it's, um, again, one of the chapters from the book, I've only had a chance to do that talk once, so doing it on the actual battlefield 
and talking about the, yet again, the responsibility that was taken on by Union veterans to fight and, frankly, in some ways, unsuccessful fight to resist the interpretation of the Civil War as being a lost cause, which, as you know, took hold and still has, has remnants uh, in 2024. So, again, it's always the link between the past and the present. Good morning, Steve. Bill Stubblefield. Uh, Hi. You, you mentioned that uh, uh, one of your themes is why did people fight? Uh, what percent of, of troops, both in the North and the South, were conscripted or just volunteers? Well, again, the, the, North, the Confederacy and the Union had different rules, as you know. Uh, the draft was a disaster uh, in the North, leading to what is still the worst race riot in American history, uh, the uh, draft riots in New York City. Uh, the draft was only successful in the North in getting people to volunteer, uh, which it did. Uh, the South was different. The South conscripted, and you were in the war for the duration in the Confederacy. Um, the second aspect that was different was obviously the entrance of men of color into the war in um, January of 1863 under both the new um, Second Militia Act and, of course, the Emancipation Proclamation. So the vast majority of Union soldiers were volunteers. Technically, I guess you could say in the Confederacy they were also volunteers, but they remained, uh, in many cases, against their will under the conscription that the Confederate States of the Union imposed. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, again, they're not unlike the stop loss um, that's gone on during, you know, going on during Iraq and Afghanistan. So, and of course, the motivations were completely different. The reasons why they fought were completely different. And one of the things that I emphasize in my upcoming book is the reenlistment of Union veterans in late 63, early 64, and statistics are remarkable. Um, more than half of Union veterans reenlisted, and then it, it's even more than half when you include men who had been discharged, who then came back a second time as volunteers, not under reenlistment, but literally under a second enlistment. And it's a staggering statistic when you take a look at how the war had turned even more brutal during 1864. That's when the war was at its worst, because with the entrance of African-American troops into active combat, the war was fought under a black flag um, for two reasons. Confederate soldiers abhorred white northern soldiers, whom they considered um, mercenaries. They considered them uh, people who are not, that not real Americans, because 25% were born outside the United States, and those were white soldiers. When men of color appeared in blue uniforms, it was absolutely enraging. And as I'm sure, you, or maybe not everyone is aware, that the Union officers in the United States Colored Troops fought literally under a death sentence of the Confederacy that any white officer captured would be put to death under the stipulation that they were, they were promoting servile insurrection. African-American troops were in a little better circumstance, technically, because they would not be executed, but they'd be, re they'd be returned to slavery, even though one-third of the men of color who fought in the armies of the Union were not former slaves, including the, the men from Maryland. And as you know, the among the worst war crimes committed during the Civil War was the massacre of black troops in their offices at Fort Pillow under Nathan Bedford Forrest. In the city, yes. Which he, which he yeah. never stood trial. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> at its peak, what percentage... Oh, hi, Steve. This is John. Um, what percentage of Union forces were men of color? Um, that's, that's a great question. It, it, the, official, the official number of men who fought in the armies of the Union was 186,000. Um, in addition, the integrated Navy, because the Navy was integrated, which is interesting, um, they, they had been in the Merchant Marine and also been in the Navy under um, quotas. 
easily over 200,000 men of color fought in the war. So approximately 10% of um, both Union soldiers and sailors were men of color. Now, I tell you what's very interesting about the state of Maryland, and as, as all three of you know, I'm doing a lot of talks now about, about Maryland, which has a border state that stayed in the Union. It's absolutely fascinating um, that there were 9,000 men of color from a, a, from a, a border state, a border slave state, that were able to enlist uh, once um, the African-American troops were um, able to join the armies in 1863. Plus there were, I think, uh, at least two or 3,000 served in the Navy. That's in addition to all the white troops who served from the state of Maryland. And let me dispel a myth. For decades, people taught that half of the soldiers from Maryland fought for the Confederacy and half fought for the Union. That is absolutely wrong. The vast majority of white men from the, from the state of Maryland fought for the Union. They did not fight for the Confederacy. That's a new scholarship that uh, several of us are really trying to emphasize. And that's in addition, like I said, to the close to 9,000 men of color who enlisted in the USCT through uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the um, um, Second Militia Act. As a matter of fact, there's a great exhibit at Monocacy uh, because the railroad junction there was actually a USCT recruiting um, station. And um, I want to give a plug for my, my friend and colleague, Matt Borders, and his colleagues at Monocacy. They're going to be doing a terrific event on Wednesday for Juneteenth. And that'll be uh, one of the things that they'll be talking about. You mentioned the term MSC, NSCT, a couple of times. What does that mean? Uh, United States Colored Troops. Okay. Um, the, now, initially, and again, th these are great questions you're asking. Initially, many states had African-American troops enlist in all black regiments. Uh, Ohio was an example of that. But most of them came, were eventually, were um, regiments that were then designated United States Colored Troop Regiments, which were national regiments. Now, there was some states that, do, that did keep the state designation for uh, African-American units. Of course, the most famous was the Massachusetts 54th, uh, the Glory Regiment, uh, and the marvelous film about them. Iowa did, Connecticut did. Uh, but the vast majority of um, African-American soldiers fought in USCT regiments under white officers. And um, by the end of the war, there were about 100 um, African-American soldiers who actually received their commissions. So, again, a very small number, but it, it's an example of what happened in four years that would have been unthinkable of almost 200,000 men of color serving in the armies and navies of the Union, and some of them attaining commissions. I mean, John Brown would have been amazed at what happened four years after his execution. Um, for, by the way, you know what John Brown was, was tried under, what the charges that John Brown was executed under? Treason, wasn't it? Treason against whom? Uh, the United States? No, the state of Virginia. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. He attacks, you know, they, 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 they try and take over the armory in what was then, of course, it was not West Virginia, that was Virginia. And he was, he was charged against trees in the state of Virginia, which is almost inexplicable, but yes, that's what he was executed under. They is also he... made a terrible mistake. They, John Brown was not executed immediately after he was convicted. He was executed about, I think, four or five weeks later. In the interim, John Brown was interviewed. John Brown uh, made it clear why he and his band had done what they had done. And that had an impact because it, people like Abraham, like Abraham Lincoln excoriated his methods and railed against the violence of what had happened. But he became a symbol of abolition way before that became the acknowledged, one of the acknowledged war aims for the Union. Again, I'm, 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 an amazing story. Yeah. Steve, I'm, going to, I'm asking a question I think I know the answer to. Uh, you mentioned some of the, uh, the black uh, enlisted were commissioned as officers. Did any of them ever lead a white brigade? 
I did not think so. Yeah. No, as you know, um, they and that did not happen. Boy, uh, well into the 20th century, as you know, when the when the military was desegregated by Truman's executive order, that did not order, uh, immediately transfer to um, African American officers, such as people like the Tuskegee Airmen. Eventually, it was. Obviously, in Nam. African American uh, officers led white troops. Um, my, I would presume in Korea that also must have taken place because it was truly an integrated army at that point. So what was that? Almost 100 years later, um, out, out on the frontier, you know, the famous Buffalo soldiers who served in the regular army uh, with great distinction um, were all commanded by white tro- by white officers, even though there was some commissions again, in the regular army, in between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. In World War I, um, African-American troops in Europe actually fought under French command, as, as you may remember, and, of course, served with great distinction, uh, many of them receiving the Croix de Guerre and others. So um, you know, these are all great questions, and, and the history is, is so rich and it all really started with the Civil War. And, um, but the, the same lesson had to be relearned several times before the armies were finally desegregated, that African-American troops served brilliantly, bravely, under conditions that um, many people would simply not have tolerated. Hey, and Steve. they endured. And again, we have people like uh, Benjamin Davis, you know, the, uh, who ended up, what, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, again, one of the Tuskegee Airmen. And these are all people who broke down barriers. Uh, <clears throat> General Lee surrendered to Grant in April of 1865, right? And that was the first of the Confederate armies to surrender. That's correct. Juneteenth celebrates the freeing of the slaves in Galveston in Texas. That's which, correct. Which army was that when was the last of the confederate when did the last of the confederate armies surrender and who the was last that? the last engagement was in the west and the last large confederate army was uh, johnston's army that surrendered to sherman so the war did not end with appomattox um it really was in the carolinas and um when they held the grand review in Washington, um, which is when, at, at that point, uh, Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated, there were still people in the field, particularly African-American troops, by the way. Uh, most of the African-Ameri- African-American troops had enlisted under different time intervals. And, for example, many of the troops that occupied the, um, the Confe- former Confederate states during Reconstruction were a- African-American troops because they were still in the Union Army. Or at that point, they were transferred into the regular army. Uh, most white troops who chose not to remain were discharged. Uh, basically, that's why they had the, the Grand Review at the time they did, because it was a couple of months after, after Appomattox. Had any, of the uh, conf- had, had any of the Confederate armies not yet surrendered when Lincoln was killed, or are they all already? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, again, again, because Lincoln was assassinated April 4th, no, April 14th. Right. That's when he was shot, 1022 at night. In Ford's Theater, no, they, no, they were. Um, they, there had been no surrender yet in the Carolinas, and they were still fighting in other in other isolated areas in the West. No, there were. There was the Civil War was not over, um, and you know that's one of the controversies about the investigation of the Lincoln conspiracy. That was performed by a military commission, not a not a civilian court even though civilian courts are still operating. And that commission was led by someone else who I'm lecturing about. By the way, I do want to mention, if that's okay, if that's okay Rob? Steve, I got, I, I've got about 30 seconds left, so you'd have to squeeze it in tight. Yeah, I'm going to be talking at the B&O Museum in Baltimore on the 29th on a brand new talk about the relationship of the railroads to the Battle of Monocacy, and that, of course, involves Lou Wallace. And Wallace was... It, with the commission that um, investigated the the Lincoln conspiracy, and so uh, also a fascinating story. And that's a brand new talk I'm doing about the relationship of the railroads, John Garrett, uh, 
Lou Wallace and um, David Clendenin and how they were vital to saving Washington and Lincoln's reelection during the battle, uh, during the democracy campaign. Steve, on that note, I thank you very much for a fascinating discussion this morning. Look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. Thanks, gentlemen. Take care. Dr. Stephen Bye. A. Goldman, MD, and the